Hello and welcome back to the Essentials of Computer Architecture, Computer Architecture in Organization. And we're going to continue on in our process of working through the material in our textbook. Um, the topic that we're going to um, go over now is Chapter 7, Operand Addressing Instruction Representation. So we're about a little more than halfway through our section on processors. And this is a, uh, another example of a, a next developmental step of what we're trying to help us all become a little bit more familiar with and how um, computing um, systems operate. So how many operands does each instruction use? And we're gonna talk uh, about a couple examples and we have mentioned at least at this level of detail um, in previous chapters, but a given architecture usually has the, the same number for, for most instructions. Um, there, there's four basic architectural types. You have um, instructions that have no operands. You have one that have one, others that have two, and others that have three operands. And so um, we, can classify these into categories of different types of instructions. So let's look at these one at a time. And so we have the zero address architecture. This is, can be called a stack-based architecture. So there's no explicit operands in the instruction. So the, the program, what, what is called push, it, it pushes the operand onto the stack in memory and executes the instructions. So load, execute, load, execute, we're, we're seeing that, but it's, there's um, a convention that it knows where to find what to load in and execute, and that is in memory. And so the instruction executes, it removes the top N items from the stack and leaves the result on top of the stack. And so the convention is you're, you're just using the, the, the stack, which is a um, special area of memory that you, you know where the, the results are, are being stored and you, you implement that. Um, we'll mention this in a, in a minute, but it's sort of like a, a calculator, if, if you will. Um, so here's an example of a zero address instructions. Um, increment variable x in the memory by seven. That's what we're trying to accomplish. So we push x to the stack, we push seven to the stack, and this convention, the, this form of the add, it knows that these are the two things that you're adding, x and seven, and then it pops it off the stack. So that's what we're trying to, to do here. So we push the instruction place, a copy of the variable x on the stack, add the instruction, removes two arguments from the stack and leaves the result on the stack. And pop, instruction removes item off the top of the stack and places the item in the variable x. So it starts with x, it ends with x, we stick things on the stack, and then when we're done, we put it back to the variable um, that we initially were using. So that's for zero address. Now let's have, one address architecture, let's look at that. So it's analogous to a calculator. There's one explicit operand per instruction. The processor has a special register known as the accumulator. It holds a, the, the second argument for, for each instructions. It's used to store the result of, of an instruction. So that's a, a little bit of an overview of the one address instruction. And here is an illustration. So we want to increment the variable x in the memory by seven. And we have three different subtasks that needs to be um, accomplished. And so we, we load x, we add seven to that, and then we store x. Load places a copy of the variable x in the accumulator. Add increases the value in the accumulator. In this case, it'd be adding seven. And then it stores a copy in the accumulator value into a variable x in memory. So it starts with x, we load that, and then when we're all done, it, it, it sends it back to the variable x in memory. Third 
um, let's talk about the two address architecture. The, the two explicit operators per instruction, that's what we're dealing with here. The result overwrites one of the two operands. And so instead of having two inputs and an output, you have two inputs and one of the inputs turns out to the root as the result. Thus it overwrites one of the operands. The, the operands is known as source and destination. It works well for ins instructions such as a memory copy. Um, and so here's an example and as compared to the previous examples, to, to do this function, we're now just doing it with one instruction. We increment a variable x in memory by seven, and this is what it would look like. We compare, we com it computes x plus seven in place of the result variable x. So this is um, a lot more concise and starts to begin to have some of the features you might be familiar with some higher level um, language whether it be Java, C, C++, something like that. But here we're, we're still talking about assembly language programming. The fourth category is the three address architecture. Three explicit operands per instruction are specified. The operands specify two values and a location for the result. So two inputs and one output. The operands are often called the, the following. There's the, the source. There's the destination for instructions that only need two operands, and then there's a result um, if all three operands are, are needed. For a three um, address architecture, we would be having to, to use all of those. So here's an illustration of a three address instruction. We add the variable y to the variable x and place it in the in result in variable z. So um, there's no overriding. You have three different variables, and so you would be maintaining the, the two inputs, but the addition of those is put into the output Z. So that gives us a quick little um, overview with a little bit more detail for these four categories of instructions. Let's talk now about source and destination operands. Source operands can specify one of four different types of things. It can represent a signed constant. It can uh, represent an unsigned constant, the, the contents of a register or a value in memory. And so we talked a little bit about constants, some um, integers and stuff like that. With how, what would be the kind of format that you could use for a signed or an unsigned. Um, and we're gonna be talking about indirection shortly, but a source can refer to a register or a memory. And so those are, that the first one is, is, is a source. Now thinking about the, the destination, a destination operand can specify a single register, a pair of contiguous registers, or a memory location. And so maybe you just need to know where you're starting. Um, and so that would be um, important. Say you're, you're thinking about a pair of contiguous registers. Um, and so that, that's those two categories. The operand types, let, let's um, start this with, with a question. How does a processor know whether an operand specifies a constant, a register, or a memory address? And the answer is each operand has a type that tells a processor how to interpret the operand. And we'll be walking through what that might look like as we go through the next handful of slides here. The intermediate value and memory references, um, so as we're Introducing this, an operand that gives a signed or unsigned constant is known as an intermediate operand. Of course, constants could be placed in memory. The question is why have intermediate operands? And the answer is memory references are expensive compared to accessing an intermediate value. And so that's the, the, the rationale behind that. So if we do, something and break it up into pieces and thus we have an incremental value, um, we get into the possibility of having something called the von Neumann bottleneck. 
And if you might remember a von Neumann architecture, you have your CPU, you have your memory, and you have your I.O. So if we have a bottleneck in your memory, that's going to cause problems. So the, this von Neumann bottleneck, it's a general engineering principle. It refers to the cost of memory references, um, often is stated as follows. If a computer that follows a von Neumann architecture, the time spent performing memory accesses can limit the overall performance, and that's the operative word. It takes a long time to get to memory, read the memory, and get that information back. That's going to definitely cause a, a bottleneck in your performance. So this motivates using immediate operands or placing operands in registers. And so we're seeing this distinction between registers that are extremely close, extremely fast to the CPU versus going to, to memory and um, having that take longer. And so that, that's what we're specifying here. So two types of operand encoding, uh, we can have implicit types of encoding and we can have explicit type of encoding. For implicit, the opcode specifies the type of each operand. Um, there are many opcodes are, are necessary and an example of a, an opcode, this is um, longer than it would be written for an actual instruction but it gives you an idea of it, exactly what it's referring to, add signed immediate to register and you'll see a shorthand uh, for an acronym that would be used in, in real life. So that would be implicit for explicit. Um, each operand has extra bits that specify a type. And so this requires few, fewer opcodes. An example would be add, and the two operands specify the type, signed, immediate, and register. So um, that's just a little bit of insight into how that would work. And um, we can, let's first have a couple examples in implicit encoding. So talking about an add register. So we add register one and register two, and we put the result in register one. That would be adding register. For add an immediate signed, so that means that we have, um, knowledge that we're talking about a register and we have an immediate and so we have the result of what's in the register and what's in the immediate we load that into register one for add immediate unsigned we have a register one we have this unsigned um, information that we want to combine so we add register one with the unsigned immediate and put that into register one and, and Finally, the add memory, we have knowledge of what's in register one, we have the, the location and what is in the memory, and so we add the, what the content of the memory is to what's in the register one, and we stick the, the result into register one. So um, let's talk about explicit encoding. Let's have a couple examples. The add operation with registers one and two as operands. And so um, this would be how it would, would look that we have the, the register as the first operand, that would be register one, for example, and we have operand number two, um, register two here. And so that, that's what we're trying to, to show. Um, if we want to do an addition with register one and an unsigned immediate value of 93, minus 93 is an operand, this is what it would, would look like. And so we have the, the register number one, and then we have the designation that this is an unsigned integer, and the contents of that unsigned integer are minus um, 193. So that's some specifics to, to think about for, for that case. Operands that combine multiple types. Um, there's uh, ways that we can combine types. Operands contain multiple items. A processor computes operands values from individual items. The typical computation that we can use to consider this is sum. 
And so as an example, a register offset operand specifies a register and an immediate value. The processor adds an immediate value to contents of register and uses the result as, a, as an operand. So here's an example of a register offset. For the opcode, we have add. And so for operand one, we have a register offset. Um, and for operand two, we have a register offset. And so the first operand consists of the value in register two. So we're, we're specifying what the register is. And then we have the, the value is minus 17. The second operand consists of the value in register four. And the content of that is 76. So we want to be adding minus 17 and plus 76. So what are the operand trade-offs that we would want to consider? There's no single style of operand that is oper optimal for all purposes. And so there's a trade-off among a variety of different things. Um, the ease of programming, um, having the, the fewest instructions, having the, the smallest instructions, um, having a large, larger range of immediate values, um, having the, the faster operand fetch and decoder and decreasing hardware size. And so as a result, we have different processors that um, have um, configurations that are, are different. And so we will be talking about a, a MIPS processor, having a processor pipeline, x86 would be something done in a different way. And so these types of the decisions are, are evaluated and you think about what are the, the likely um, purposes that this processor would be used in making those design, design decisions to accommodate with what would be the most probable, most commonly used way of using your processor. So let's talk a little bit about operands in memory and indirect reference. Um, we'll have a picture or two that hopefully will talk about indirect memory access and you'll start to get some insight into what that might mean. Uh, an operand can specify the value in memory, the, that is the, the memory reference, or the location in memory that contains the address of the operand. Uh, operand. This is called indirect reference. So you go to a memory location and that's exactly the contents that you want to be um, processing. That's option number one. Option number two, you go to that memory and the information in that memory location is the location where you then have to go to to get the information that you want to process. So that's what we're trying to describe. So and something you want to consider is accessing memory is relatively expensive in terms of sign uh, time. And that, that can be a penalty that you would have to be considering. Indirection can make a program um, look elegant. And in some ways it actually can act help out. Um, and so that, that is one of the reasons why it can be a useful thing to, to be thinking about. Um, indirect, let's talk about types of indirection. And the first is indirection through a register, and the second is indirection through a memory location. We're gonna have more memory than we're gonna have registers, so there's not as much flexibility you would have using registers. But if you're using just a very few of the total registers that you have in your programming style, maybe this is something that you could leverage and it, it wouldn't be much of a penalty at all. So the operand specifies a register number, say R. After obtaining A, the current value from, from register A, we interpret A as a memory address and fetch the operand from memory location A. So register contains a, the, the location of where we, we want to be getting things from the, the, the memory. And so um, the, the A is the, the address where that would be located. So the, another option is the is indirections through memory location. The uh, operand specifies a memory address A. We go there in memory location and we get M. 
M is a, another address where we have to go to in order to get the information that we want to, to process. And so um, that's how that would look. So hopefully this diagram will help to, to clarify this. And we're trying to show the um, illustrations of operand address modes. And so first, let's um, talk about the immediate value in the instruction. And so here um, we have in the CPU, we have the instruction register and it, we go, um, that tells us exactly what we want to be processing. Um, we, we have um, direct register reference. And so for number two, um, it tells us exactly um, what we want to be processing. Um, for direct memory reference, this gives us um, the, 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 we need to be getting something from memory. And so this tells us exactly where to, to look. But this is where, we're, in these latter steps here, we're trying to get an, an idea of what indirection looks like. And so the instruction register, what it, what it does is it's, um, it's pointing to memory and that memory then sends us to another memory location and that's where we want to be processing that. And this oftentimes is used when you're trying to have blocks. Um, and so say you have a hundred or so things that the, the code and the operation could be a lot more efficient if you just have this, this indirection, you increment it and you just go through this block one at a time. And the way that you configure virtual memory, um, and we're not gonna get to that until later, that, that can be another reason that maybe you need to have to be told where exactly to, to look for um, the actual information that you're trying to process. And indirection can be a way of simplifying that. So we can have indirect through memory. We can have indirect through the registers. Um, and so that's a, a quick diagram to, to give you some, some highlights about that. To summarize, architects choose a number and types of operands for each instruction. The possibilities include immediate, that there's a constant value, and so you don't have to go anywhere to get the information that's right there. You can have the contents of the register and that's what you want to be processed. And so that's already been loaded into the register. Uh, another alternative is that the value is in memory. And so you go to that memory location, that is exactly what you wanna process. Or we have this indirect reference. And so you go to a memory location and the first time you go, that's just giving you another location, another address to go to. And when you go to that second one, that is the information that you wanna process. The types of operands can be encoded either implicitly that the operands determine the types of the um, operands. So the opcode is the instructions say add, and then you can have zero, one, two, or three operands following that. Or you can have explicitly that there's extra bits in each operand that specify the type. Many variations exist, each represent a trade-off. And so I'm just gonna back up just for a minute in, in, in this um, review just to help point out a couple things. And so we had examples of where um, we were defining some of these offsets and um, having this, this, these extra bits that you use to specify what's going on. And so that's what we're talking about here, just as a reminder for explicitly. And the implicitly is that you have to implicitly tell with the, the opcode what exactly you're going to, to do. So explicitly, you're gonna have um, maybe a more general opcode, and then you're gonna have bits in each of the operand fields that help clarify things or a more explicit naming convention for your opcode. Anyway, that's a quick summary on this. 
if you do have questions, we will be talking about this more in class. And there's plenty of good detail in the textbook. Thank you. Bye-bye.